Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, unfortunately, my talk today is going to be more like a Monty Python skit, and now for something completely different. Because I'm used, at least for me anyway, because I'm used to talking about my own research. And instead, what I'm going to be talking about is the research of lots and lots and lots of other people, including some of them in the room. Um, but nevertheless, I've been fortunate to be involved with something called the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. And if you haven't heard of it, you should. Uh, I don't know where you've been. But in any event, the idea is I want to talk to you about what it is and humbly give you an idea as to where I think it should go in the future. Um, you're probably aware of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. Uh, they produce a number of assessment reports over the years. Right now, they're in the fifth assessment report, which came out in 2013, 2014, and we'll move on to the sixth assessment report probably in a couple years or so. The key word that they use is uh, clearly the intergovernmental panel on climate change. So it's intergovernmental, meaning between governments. And as you know, once you get government involved in anything, not only can you not get it out, it creates all sorts of potential problems. Um, the way they define climate change, of course, is based upon the framework convention of climate change, Article 1.2, which says a change in climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and which in addition to natural climate variability observed over comparable time periods. So the idea is that climate change is defined as essentially an anthropogenic cause. That's what they're looking for. They're looking to document it. They're looking to determine the extent to which humans affect it because, of course, being a wing of the UN uh, and having governments involved, the government therefore has a problem that needs solving. And so we can change it from climate change to climate conundrum to climate uh, catastrophe. Um, it becomes a climate collusion and probably a climate cash cow for lots of people but I'll stop there. Any event, um, so their mandate is really to find this anthropogenic cause, document it, and therefore look for solutions by which they can stop it. The second assessment report came out in 1995. Uh, there was an interesting quote in there that was, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. Uh, it's relatively mild by today's standards, but was a bit of a shocker in 1995. I think Fred Singer, who I'll mention a bit in a moment, um, Fred was one of, the, one of the first to notice and to bring out the fact that this sort of appeared without discussion by the other governments. Supposedly the IPCC reports are, are voted upon, uh, which is not the way you normally do science, but this is the IPCC. And so they didn't vote on this, but it magically appeared in the end. Um, I got involved in this because after the word climate, there were several articles listed by Sander and Wigley, and um, one of the things they, they had created was this centered pattern correlation coefficient. And the argument was if you take the observations and you take the models and the correlation coefficient goes up, you're saying the observations look more like the models. If the models are driven by carbon dioxide, therefore we have a proof that says that the observations are being driven by carbon dioxide and hence the argument for the statement. Well, Bob Davis and I looked at this closely and found out that if you take two sets, an observation and a model that are identical and you have them become less similar. In fact, the, the uh, centered pattern correlation coefficient can also go up, um, which really underscores the whole problem behind the centered pattern correlation coefficient. But I learned quickly that this has nothing to do with the science when I was taken aside by a statistician at a meeting and said, you had no right to publish that article. And I said, what are you talking about? You know that that statistic is completely worthless. And he said, yeah, I know it, and everybody else knows it. And we don't plan on ever using it again, but you had no right to criticize Sander and Wigley. And as I said, then I knew this has nothing to do with science. Six years later, the third assessment report comes out, and that was the uh, famous man, Bradley Hughes, hockey stick, which shows, of course, that uh, climate didn't, didn't really change from about 1000 AD to 1900 AD, and then, of course, humans started to burn fossil fuels, and the temperatures took off like wildfire. Uh, there was, you know, um, he left us with the argument, the 1990s are likely the warmest decade, and the 1998 being the warmest year in at least a millennium. 
Um, Willie Soon and I and a couple other people looked at this and said we disagree that there really was a global effect to the medieval warm period and Little Ice Age, which we're missing from this. And I learned that two strikes and you're out, and life has been fun ever since. But as a result of the third assessment report, uh, Fred Singer, who works for, created the Science and Environmental Policy Project, which you can find online as www.sepp.org, uh, had put together an informal meeting in Milan, Italy in 2003. The goal of that meeting was essentially to come up with an independent, non-governmental panel to apply the scientific evidence on the subject at the time of sea induced global warming in anticipation of the release of the fourth assessment report that was coming forward. That eventually resulted in a book, uh, which was or a pamphlet, I should say, which included 24 other co-authors, was joined in publication by the Heartland Institute and goes by the title, Nature, Not Human Activity Rules the Climate, that many of you have probably seen, read, and, and, and know well. The Heartland Institute, I'll say, uh, is also available online at www.heartland.gov, sorry, or excuse me, yeah, org, org www.heartland.org. Should have been easy. <laughs> Gov, yeah. All right, so what is this thing called the NIPCC? A lot of leftist blogs say it's just the IPCC with the word non in front of it because the, uh, these people are a bunch of uh, non-anti-climate non -naysay naysayers. That's not what it is. It's the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, key on non-governmental and international. And so it's an international panel of scientists who come together without the trappings of the UN, without the trappings of governments that have an agenda to set to say what do we see in terms of climate variability and change, what can we say, what can't we say, what is the current status of the climate. It is not designed to be therefore government sponsored, politically motivated, uh, or predisposed into believing that climate change is a problem in need of a UN solution. Based upon that, um, Craig Itso and CO2 Science, and I'll try to get this one right, www.co2science.org. Did I get it right? Yes, yeah, fingers, thumbs up, sounds good. Uh, was brought in, and so Fred and Craig um, essentially were editors on Climate Change Reconsidered, which is the name of the report of the non-intergovernmental panel on climate, non-governmental international panel on climate change, which was produced in, in 2009. They added the late Bob Carter uh, in 2013 and produced Climate Change Reconsidered II, uh, The Physical Science in 2014, Biological Impacts, and in 2015 was Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming, a report on the scientific consensus uh, that everybody knows 97% of all scientists agree, um, which, yeah, they don't. But any event. Uh, at that point, unfortunately, Bob Carter left us, um, and so we are now added by myself and Roger Bezde Bezdek, if I got, hope I got your name right, Bezdek, um, to be the new editors. And so with Fred and Craig, the four of us put together Climate Change Reconsidered Two Fossil Fuels, which has just come out. It is available in hard copy, and you can buy your copy only for $10 outside. I'm not selling them, I don't get a kickback, but I think it's amazing that something this important um, and of this size is available to you for $10. In any event, I also want to uh, give credit to uh, Joe and Diane Bast. Uh, both of them did a lot of work in putting this together as well as editors. And I don't think, at least from my view, the uh, 2019 version would have appeared had it not been for their work. Um, there's a lot of other people I won't take the time to name, but they're very, very important as chapter lead authors, contributing authors, and chapter reviewers. And if your name's up there on the board, uh, or if your name isn't, as several additional reviewers and contributors wish to remain anonymous, uh, I thank you from myself as an editor for uh, taking the time to make this what I think is a very important document that really needs to be in the hands of anybody who's really concerned about climate change. Um, so what we have essentially is the IPCC, which we've all talked about, and now we have essentially the NIPCC uh, that we can go along with it, if you see what I did there. Now, the question is, no. Sorry. 
Sorry. Well, anyway. So we have the NIPCC. Now, the question is, where do we go from here? The IPCC produces things in book form and has really not progressed beyond that point. And I think there's a reason to that. If you remember back, way back when uh, the, the Bible was written in Latin, because I think what they like to have are climate scientists come down as the pre high priests of climate scientists to proclaim the IPCC says, when in fact the IPCC has not thus saith, because you're not gonna read it all, and in, besides, if you do, you're probably going to cut to the chase and read the summary for policymakers, which in many cases is not the cliff notes of the science document, and there are differences there as well. But what I want to introduce to you is a friend of mine. His name is Peter Waller. Um, I don't really have a picture for Peter, but everybody says he looks like um, um, Dennis, Quaid. Dennis Quaid. Thank you. He looks like Dennis Quaid, so I stole a picture of Dennis Quaid, and you won't know the difference. Um, <laughs> but any event. Pete uh, is probably, I always said, the oldest friend of mine. I have older friends, but he's been his friend the longest, um, which probably says a lot about him. But in any event, um, I've known him since, high, since college, and in particular, he put himself through college by selling encyclopedias door to door. And I said, how can you do that in the Midwest, going door to door, talking to people you don't know, trying to sell them a bunch of, diction, a bunch of encyclopedias? And he said, well, you learn, you know, talk to people and understand how they behave and what they're looking for. And you notice a lot of them are, have kids and were particularly grandchildren. And they were really interested at the time in, in making sure they were well educated and they had a chance. And at the time, all we had were libraries. And a lot of cases in the Midwest, it was a long distance to the library. So it would be nice to have a mini library at home. And that was the selling point that you could buy a mini library for a cheap amount of money. And you could have an encyclopedia to sort of look up information. So I got thinking, well, now that we've, we've come a long way, uh, there's certainly nobody going door to door selling uh, encyclopedias. So what's happened to the Encyclopedia Britannica, for example? Well, it turns out Encyclopedia Britannica is no longer produced in hard copy and hasn't been for the last seven years. So does that mean they've gone out of business? Well, clearly they haven't. What they've done is they've come into the digital age. So what happens is you go to Encyclopedia Britannica, you pull up, for example, the Greenland ice sheet if you're interested in information, let's say, on what's going on in Greenland. You get a number of results, you click on them, and what you get in this case is that the Greenland Ice Sheet uh, gives you information on it, and it's written by the editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica, who are cutting edge, leading scientists in the field, of course. But what I'm thinking is what we have in hard copy form is much better prose, much better written prose, but much better scientific document that has a lot of information. How do we get that into the hands of students, into the hands of researchers, into the hands of policymakers, in the hands of people that need this information? Few people are gonna find the book, few people are gonna wade through the PDF, but if we could take a sheet out of the Encyclopedia Britannica and possibly therefore look at a way of doing this online, then maybe you could pull up, for example, the non-governmental the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, look for the Greenland ice cap and find the discussion which we've already put together. And now the idea would be, it would be available to students, it would be available to people that need it in a format that they're much more likely to look for. And of course, what I said is we've done, if you're not familiar with this, please take a look at it because there's a lot of information there, a lot of science information, there's conclusion, and there's hardcore references of science. So the idea is it's not just a bunch of blog sites all logged together as essentially the naysayers on the left would like you to believe. It's researched science activity and so it uh, gives you research in science. Um, so at this point, my thought is I know I'm, I'm long on ideas and probably short on finances. That's why largely I'm a scientist and not an academic. Um, but I really, I really, Having put the bid part of this, I should say, for the last year or so, uh, I've really become to realize it's a very important resource and we can't just simply let it go by the boards and that, at least in my view, is where we should go next. Maybe there's somewhere else we should go and I'm willing to listen to that too, but my thought is this is sort of where we need to go. Before I leave, I want to give some credit to the people that started this all. 
You have Bob Carter on the left. You have Fred Singer. My understanding is that Fred is actually with us on the internet. Uh, so if you're there, Fred, thanks. Um, you may not be listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. And the third person, I don't have a picture for, but I don't need one because he's physically here today, and that would be Craig Itso, who's over here. So stand up, Craig. <laughs> Wherever he is, there he is. And with that, I say thank you very much, and uh, I'll turn it back to Sterling. <laughs>